Tomorrow Pictures. The story is in the telling. The open mind, free to examine, to question, to disagree. Our subject today, the new Negro. Your host on The Open Mind is Richard D. Hefner, author and historian. I think it's safe to say that a lot of the Negro in America has, throughout our history, deeply bothered the conscience of each and every one of us who deeply believes in traditional American principles of democracy and liberty and justice and freedom. Uh, I think this may be a little less true today than ever before. And yet, for the larger part of American history, I think we ought to realize that the Negro, more or less, was in slavery. I think the Negro was more likely to be a slave for the greater part of our history than not. And quite naturally, the attitude of the Negro towards the white, of the white towards the Negro, and of the Negro towards himself, has been conditioned and tempered and molded in very large part by the fact of a long history of slavery. Besides, I think it's important to remember that slavery as an institution put a premium not upon self-assertiveness and the understanding of one's own human dignity, but upon acquiescence by the Negro slave. And I think that one can fairly say that the acquiescent, submissive Negro slave was generally, well, to put it very bluntly, generally safer than the self-assertive Negro who is conscious of his own human dignity and of the democratic philosophy that is the American heritage. As a matter of fact, I think we could admit that the whole myth, myth that we have built up about the Old South, in which slavery existed, has been a myth in which we see the picture of the happy, acquiescent slave. The Negro is a slave. The Negro who is acquiescent, acquiescent is happy. The Negro who is happy is, by definition, acquiescent. Negroes are happy because they accept their lot. And think of the movies and the books and the plays and the novels that we read and see about slavery in the Old South. We see the Negro who is acquiescent as happy. The Negro slave who is self-assertive, who looks for his own rights, is considered a troublemaker. Even when slavery was brought to an end by the Civil War, it was said that acquiescence and acceptance by the Negro of his lot, well, these were the greater part of wisdom. It was said that the Negro could gain more by submerging his own sense of dignity than by asserting it. Uh, that the Negro would so antagonize others by demanding his own rights that it was better for him to bide his time at each step along the way, wait for something to be given to him rather than demand it as of his own right. Well, men of goodwill, I think both Negro and white cannot deny that to some extent there is validity to this argument. But the degree of that extent, to what extent this is true, is the question that we must face today. In recent years, there have grown up leaders amongst both Negroes and whites who feel that a just and a wise self-assertiveness is necessary on the part of the Negro. There has been, emerging in our own times, a new Negro, a Negro who is aware of his own dignity and of the American tradition of liberty and justice. We want to talk today about that new Negro, about who he is and what he is, and our guests are quite expert in the subject. My first guest is the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. of Montgomery, Alabama. Reverend King has been very much involved in the demand by the new Negro for his rights in the Negro bus boycott in Montgomery and in many other instances. My second guest is a jurist. Judge J. Wadey's Waring, formerly federal judge in South Carolina, a gentleman whose decisions in the area of segregation paved the way in a very real sense for what became in 1954 the Supreme Court's decision that segregation in our public schools is unconstitutional. The well, gentlemen, suppose we begin this discussion by letting me well, first ask you, Dr. King, in your estimation, what and who is this new Negro? I think I could uh, best answer that question by saying first that the new Negro is 
a person with a new sense of dignity and destiny, with a new self-respect. Along with that uh, is this uh, lack of fear which uh, once characterized the Negro, this uh, willingness to stand up courageously for what he feels is just and uh, what he feels he deserves on the basis of the laws of the land. Uh, I think also included would be uh, this self-assertive attitude that you just mentioned. And all of these factors come together to make what uh, seems to me to be the new Negro. I think also I would like to mention this uh, uh, growing honesty uh, which characterizes the Negro today. Uh, there was a time that the Negro used uh, duplicity uh, or deception to, uh, rather as a survival technique. Although he didn't particularly like conditions, he, he said he liked them because uh, he felt that the boss wanted to hear that. But now from the housetops, from the kitchen, from the classrooms, and from the pulpits, the Negro says in no uncertain terms that he doesn't like the way he's being treated. So at long last, the Negro is telling the truth. And I think this uh, is also one of the basic characteristics of the new Negro. Judge Waring, does this sound like an adequate description of the Negro uh, whom you know today? Honest half, no, I think it's excellent. It's an excellent summary. Uh, my observation of the Negro, and I'm speaking in generalities, of course, has been that uh, up to recently he's been a half man or a part man. And now at last he's waking up to the fact that he's a whole man, that he's an American citizen, and that uh, he is entitled to rights, no more, no less, than just the ordinary run-of-the-mill American citizen. He's never had that before. He hasn't been allowed to have it. He's been under political domination. He's been under stress. He's been under economic uh, uh, deprivations. He's been a, a servant, uh, formerly a slave. And now, suddenly, I see the idea has come to him that he's really, truly, a man that can stand up on his own hind legs and tell the truth and say, I want not any special privilege. I don't want any special handout. I don't want to be given anything because the giving idea is all wrong. But I want a chance to become a full man and do my part, be it little or be it big, in the community of our country. But doesn't this raise the question of tactics, though? Uh, you say, you use the word honesty. You, you feel that honesty is uh, important here, too. But as a matter of securing for the Negro his rights, do you feel that this aggressiveness, this self-assertiveness, will get him more in the long run than going along with contemporary opinion and biding his time, taking step by step as he goes? I think, uh, I think it's better to be aggressive at this point it seems to me that it is both historically and sociologically true that privileged classes do not give up their privileges voluntarily uh, and uh, they do not give them up without strong resistance and all of the gains that uh, have been made uh, that uh, we have received in the area of civil rights have come about because the negro stood up uh, courageously for these rights, and he was willing to aggressively press on. So I would think that it would be much better in the long run to stand up and uh, be aggressive uh, with understanding goodwill and uh, with a sense of discipline, yet these things should not uh, be substitutes for uh, pressing on. And with this aggressive uh, attitude, uh, I believe that we will bring the gains or other civil rights into being much sooner than uh, we would just standing idly by, waiting for these things to be given voluntarily. Well, what about the ill will that's generated by the aggressiveness? Certainly your own experience in Montgomery. Uh, you've been the uh, target of bomb attacks. 
You've been the target of verbal and other kinds of violence. What about the ill will that is generated by aggressiveness? Well, I think that is a necessary phase of the transition. Whenever oppressed people uh, stand up for their rights and uh, rise up against the oppressor, so to speak, uh, the initial response uh, of the oppressor is bitterness. Uh, that's, uh, that's true in most cases, I think. And that is what we are now experiencing in the South, is this initial response of bitterness, which I hope will be transformed into uh, uh, a more brotherly attitude. We hope that the end will be redemption and reconciliation rather than a division. But this, it seems to me, is a necessary phase of the transition from the old order of segregation and discrimination to the new order of uh, freedom and justice. And uh, this should not last uh, forever. It's just something that's natural right now. And as soon as we pass out of the shock period into the more creative period of adjustment, I think that bitterness and ill will will pass away. This sounds in a sense to be, uh, if I may say this, in a sense to be a denial of the judicial process, saying we will work uh, the judicial process doesn't allow for uh, the violent activity, the aggressiveness. And it means, in a sense, stepping outside, not outside the law, but outside that slow step-by-step -step process that has been going on uh, in the courts. Do you think, for instance, that the courts would have been uh, moved uh, to action that would have taken the place of your boycott in Montgomery had you not acted? you think there could be a substitute for that kind of action? I think not. I, I think uh, it was necessary to do it. I think it was uh, the time was right. And uh, I don't think there could have been a substitute at that uh, particular time. You, you think that the judicial structure... Mr. Can Hilton, for that? I want to say something on that. I, I think undoubtedly the action that Mr. King and his uh, friends took in Montgomery was... Uh, fine, necessary, and effective. Uh, remember, the courts don't go out as an executive branch of the government should and do things for you. The court declares what your rights are. And the court says to you, you're an American citizen. Now, of course, if you are scared and hide in a closet and don't exercise the rights of American citizens, the court can't send around and say you've got to do it. The courts have declared the rights, and I think that the Supreme Court decision of May 17th, 1954, was the greatest thing that's happened in this country in uh, many, many decades. And I think that it declared, it declared in effect that segregation, legal segregation, segregation by law is illegal and not a part of the American system. And all the people, the big people and the little people throughout this land have awakened to the fact that they have a right. Now remember this, it's not a matter of giving rights. Rights aren't given. The right to vote isn't given to you. It's yours, and it belongs to you. And the Negro people are beginning to realize that they are ordinary human beings and American citizens, and they have these rights. And the courts have told them so. Now, it's up to them to move out. They haven't got to go out with guns and bombs and bayonets, but they've got to go out with determination and courage and steadfastness, like this man Luther King has done, and say, here am I, and I stand here on my rights. And it's good to prevail, it's got to prevail, and it can't be beaten if we have enough of them who are steadfast enough. When they begin to compromise and sell out on principle, then they're gone. Now, it's a matter of strategy is to keep a complete, solid front. There may be tactics as to whether you, you want to make bus cases first or school cases or railroad cases or things of that kind. Those are minor details, but the strategy is you must never surrender any of the rights you have gained and you must look forward to the attainment of full equality. Well, I know that's your strategy. What about future tactics? Where do you go from here? Well, that's a 
pretty difficult question to answer at this point since uh, in Montgomery we have not worked out uh, any future plans, that is, in any chronological order. We are certainly committed to work uh, and uh, press on until segregation is non-existent in Montgomery and uh, all over the South. We are committed to full equality and uh, doing away with injustice wherever we find it. But as to the next move, I, I don't uh, have the answer for that because we have not uh, worked that out at this point. We, uh, I guess, have been so involved in the bus situation until we have not had, a, had the real time to sit down and think about next moves. But in a general sense, uh, we are committed to achieving first-class citizenship in every area of life uh, in Montgomery and throughout the southern community. Well, to what extent, uh, this is a question that has occurred to me, I wondered to what extent the judicial decision of May 1954 stimulated a greater feeling of self-respect amongst Negroes and intensified in them a willingness to assert their demands. I think it had uh, a tremendous impact and influence on, uh, on the Negro and uh, bringing about this new self-respect. I think it certainly is one of the major factors, not the only. I think several other forces uh, and uh, historical circumstances must be brought into the picture. The fact that circumstances made it necessary for the Negro to travel more so that his rural plantation background was, was gradually supplanted by a more urban industrial life. Uh, illiteracy was gradually passing away and with the growth of uh, the cultural life of the Negro, that brought about new self-respect uh, and economic growth and also the tremendous impact of the world situation with people all over the world seeking freedom from colonial powers and imperialism. These things all came together. And then with the decision of May 17, 1954, uh, we gained the culminating point. That, it seems to me, was the final point which came uh, and to bring all of these things together. And that gave this new Negro a new self-respect which uh, we see all over the South and all over the nation today. Well, if this was a final point, in a sense, a culminating point, uh, why do you ask now for another uh, act on a national level, an act, let's say, on the part of the president for a speech in the South? Why is this so important? Hasn't, uh, hasn't, haven't enough steps been made up to this point to enable you to carry the ball from here on? Well, I think it's necessary for all of the forces possible uh, to be working to implement and enforce uh, the decisions uh, that uh, are handed down by the courts. And so often in the area of civil rights, it seems that the judicial branch of the government is fighting the battle alone. And we feel that the executive and legislative branches of the government have a basic responsibility. And uh, at points, uh, these branches have been all too silent and all uh, too stagnant in their moves to implement and enforce the decisions. With the popularity of the president and uh, his uh, tremendous power and influence, just a word from him could do a great deal to ease the situation, uh, calm emotions, and uh, give Southern white liberals something to stand on if it is nothing but something to quote. Uh, the Southern white liberal uh, stands in a pretty difficult position because uh, he does not have anywhere to turn uh, for emotional security similar to what uh, hate groups, I mean the uh, the things that other groups have to turn to, the, the hate organizations, so to speak. But with a word uh, from the President of the United States with his power and influence, it would give a little more courage and uh, backbone to the white uh, liberals in the South who are 
who are willing to be allies in the struggle with the Negro for first-class citizenship. Now, to what extent, uh, let me ask you this question, Judge Waring, are white Southerners willing to be allies in the battle of the new Negro? That's a very hard question to, to answer. Uh, there are very, very few that are willing to come out in the open and say so. There are a great many, in my opinion, who would be glad if they are made to do it. I think that there are uh, lots of people, I, I sometimes use the expression that the little boy with a dirty face won't go and wash it, but if you grab him by the neck and scrub his face, he then boasts he's got the cleanest face in the gang. And I think there are many of the people in the South, and I saw many of them. Uh, my experience was that uh, officially I was quite hated and uh, condemned because I had uh, I had expressed my views to what I thought the laws of the land were. And I got a lot of uh, telephone messages and anonymous letters uh, saying they agreed with me, but they couldn't tell me why or how or who they were. And uh, those people want to be freed. Uh, but the overall picture of the politicians, no politician in the South is going to dare come out and uh, take this position of his own volition. But if the President of the United States tells him so, he's going to fall in line. And uh, if we can get the top executive people to take action, we'll get somewhere. Remember this now. Uh, the Supreme Court has laid down the law and said what's constitutional. Now, that's important. That's most important. It's the, it's the biggest thing that's ever happened. But it's got to be activated. It's got to be worked out, and the executive department has got to manipulate and work it and enforce it. And the legislative department should give the executive department more power to work and enforce these laws. You feel that action, then you do too, feel that action has to be taken on this level? Oh, yes, very definitely. Well, let me ask again, though, about the feelings of, of the Southern whites. Uh, how do you evaluate? If you had to give a progress report, how would you evaluate the battle you've fought over this past year? In terms of Southern feelings, in terms of Northern white feelings, too. Well, I think uh, we have seen, uh, we've been able to see mixed emotions at this point. Uh, for instance, over from a national point of view, looking all over the nation, we have had a tremendous response and real genuine sympathy from uh, many, many white persons, and uh, naturally we've had the sympathy of Negroes, but many, many white persons of goodwill all over the nation have given moral support and a great deal of encouragement, and that has been very encouraging to us in the struggle. Now, in the South, uh, I guess the lines are more uh, closely drawn. You find, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, a group more determined now than ever before because it is a last-ditch struggle to, to do anything, even if it means using violence to, to block all of the intentions uh, and the desires of the Negro to achieve first-class citizenship. But there are also others who have expressed sympathy. There are white Southerners, even in Montgomery, who have been quite sympathetic. Uh, as Judge Warren just said, uh, sometimes these people, uh, uh, because of fear, refuse to say anything about it. They, they stand back because of fear of economic, social, and political reprisals. But there is a silent sympathy. And we have seen a great deal of that in Montgomery. So that it's two sides, there's this side where you get the negative response, the other side where you have the positive response, and I have seen both. And uh, I think as time goes on, the negative uh, side will get smaller and smaller, and those who are willing to be open-minded and accept the trends of the ages will grow into a majority group rather than a minority. You don't feel that there'll be any violent reaction then over a long-range point of view? to the progress that has been made? No, I don't. I think uh, the violence will be uh, temporary. Maybe I don't say it will end tomorrow. We will go through some more for the next few months uh, so. 
But I, I think uh, once we are over the shock period, that shock will be absorbed and uh, Southerners will come to the point of seeing that uh, the best thing to do is to sit down and work out these problems and uh, do it in a very Christian spirit. I, I, I think the, the violence that we are undergoing now is uh, indicative of the fact that uh, the diehards realize that they are on uh, they are standing uh, at the dying point, that is the system is at its dying point, and that uh, this is a last way to try to hold on to the old order. Mr. Tefner, all great reforms have periods of, of trouble. Uh, Gandhi was murdered, uh, Jesus was crucified, and you find that uh, most great reforms have certain periods of stress and distress. Now, uh, just one last point I want to make. When we speak of, of the law, the, it's terribly important that we bring these cases and have a declaration of law, an action by Congress, an action by the executive. Because now, or up to the time of the Supreme Court's decision, segregation was legal. And segregation, even people of goodwill in the South, said, but the law says we have to keep these people separate. For instance, uh, it has been illegal for uh, me to ride in a bus with Mr. King here. Now, I don't want a law that says I've got to ride with him or he's got to ride with me, but I don't want a law that says I can't sit in a seat with him. And we've broken that, and that's an enormous advance. And we've got to do it on every stage right down the line. The Congress of the United States, I believe, uh, I've been very cynical and, and skeptical about it, but I'm beginning to believe they're going to do a little something this time. And if they do a little something, they haven't done anything in 75 years. If they do a little something this time, they'll do a little more next year. And uh, the President of the United States and the officials in the administration will begin to see that if Congress is moving, it's good politics to move, and that'll have a great motivating uh, uh, product on the, on the national picture. Uh, I think we are, we are going forward. We are going forward uh, inexorably. We've got to win. Now, it's a question whether we're going to win in the short term or long term. How do I'm you for the short term. <laughs> How do you project this into the immediate future? Well, I, uh, when I think of the question of progress in the area of race relations, I prefer to be realistic. And when I say that, I mean I try to look at it uh, not uh, from the pessimistic point of view or the optimistic, but uh, rather from the realistic point of view. I think we've come a long, long way, but we have a long, long way to go. But it seems to me that if we will press on with uh, determination, moral courage, and yet uh, wise restraint and calm reasonableness, in a few years we will reach the goal. I uh, have a great deal of faith in the future and the outcome. I am not despairing. And I'm sure as long as we have men like you, we can all have faith. Thank you so much, so Reverend King, Judge Waring. Next week we'll give a summary report of civil rights over the past year. WRCA has just presented The Open Mind. Our guests today were the Reverend Martin Luther King and Judge J. Waitys Waring. Your host on The Open Mind is Richard D. Hefner. If you have any comments or questions on today's program, or if you have any suggestions for future programs, please send them to The Open Mind, WRCA, New York 20, New York. This is TomorrowPictures.tv.